Round for lightning round talks. This is actually the second year for the, at the Lunar Science Forum that we've done lightning round talks. And last year it was a fantastic way to disseminate a large amount of information that's going on in the poster sessions to the lunar community as a whole. And so as Yvonne was talking about, the way that we've primarily structured these sessions is towards giving the students an opportunity to stand up in front of potentially future employers and, and colleagues to really give you a glimpse into what their research is about. So the structure of the format or the, the format of these talks is they have two minutes. And in that two minutes, they're expected to give their name, their institution, who they're working with, what their research is about, and how that research fits into the lunar science community as a whole. And most of them do have poster presentations as well. So please take note of where and when those posters are. There, were, there are no time, or there is no time for questions from the audience. So if you do have questions, I highly recommend you go visit them at their posters. And with that, I think that was my lightning talk on lightning talks. Um, I will stand up at 1 minute 30 to let you know you have 30 seconds left. And if you go over two minutes, we'll do a quick recreation of the l -cross impact for the audience. And, uh, and other than that, I think we're going okay, to get started. I didn't know if you're all. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kapil Gala, and I'm a grad student in the Department of Mining and Geological Engineering at the University of Arizona. My research interests are to find uh, potential locations and resources on the moon and eventually develop techniques to mine them. As NASA and other space agencies around the world are planning to have a permanent base on the moon, put back astronauts for longer durations of time, and uh, expand uh, their presence, it is going to be very difficult, ex expensive, and time consuming to take the resources from the Earth to the Moon. So it's time, it's important that uh, we start exploring the resources on the Moon itself. Recent LRO and LROS missions have shown a significant amount of uh, presence of water ice in the permanently shaded polar regions, and that could support, uh, that could give the life support for the astronauts, and they can. Uh, work there for longer durations of periods. One of the important and most promising uh, resource available on the moon is helium-3. And it has potential, again, it has a great potential for future energy. Uh, the, surf uh, the surface operations would be the primary mining operations uh, that can be developed on the, on the moon uh, because, first of all, the uh, helium-3 is uh, embedded in the regolith, so it has to be mined. And eventually, eventually, underground mine, mining operations should be like concentrated because, in addition to uh, dust contamination, one also has to be taken care of uh, the continuous bombardment of the micrometeor impacts. And uh, I think uh, mining engineering will play an important role in future space, space exploration. Um, the space program of NASA or any other spa uh, space agency in the world will, will grow stronger and become more meaningful uh, when the resources outside the Earth can be utilized and explored for the development and prosperity of this world. Uh, I have a poster in the tent, and my poster number is E27. And uh, the title is Lunar Resources, a Mining Perspective. And thank you for the opportunity. Hi, uh, my name is Morgan Nunn, and I'm a PhD student working at the University of California at San Diego with Mark Thiemens. Um, in my work there, I've developed a vacuum pyrolysis method to extract water from soil samples and subsequently analyze the oxygen isotopic composition of that water. Uh, the high precision of this method enables us to, uh, to study micromolar quantities of water. And by comparing the oxygen isotopic composition of water to minerals from a given sample, uh, we can get information about the formation and equilibration history of that sample. My research so far has been with ordinary chondrites, but I'm hoping to extend that uh, to lunar samples. Uh, to that end, I have pending application for a sample of 12039 Mare basalt. Uh, Greenwood et al. reported 12039 to have the highest water concentration of any lunar sample ever studied. Uh, they measured deuterium hydrogen ratios in 12039, and so I'm hoping that by measuring the oxygen isotopic composition of 12039, um, that we can determine um, by correlating that with the deuterium hydrogen ratios, we can determine if lunar water is cometary in origin. 
Um, I don't have a poster, but if you have any questions, please feel free to find me later this week. I'd be happy to discuss this with you. Uh, again, my name is Morgan Nunn. It shouldn't be difficult to remember. Uh, I don't know how many nuns you know with purple hair, but uh, I'm the only one I know. So thank you very much. My name is Jordan Maraca, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Colorado, where I work with Jack Burns. Uh, my poster number is A6, uh, and the title of my poster is Simulating the 21 Centimeter Signatures of the First Stars and Black Holes, uh, subtitle Predictions for Observations with a Lunar Telescope, a Lunar Farsight Telescope. And so, as you heard from Jack's talk earlier, right before lunch, the global 21 centimeter signal is expected to first be driven into absorption uh, when the first stars form and then to turn back towards emission uh, once the first black hole started creating. Um, but there's a lot more information in the signal than simply when the first stars formed and when the first black hole started creating. Uh, namely, uh, more specific information like how many, or how prevalent were the first stars, how luminous were they, how efficiently did the first generation of black holes accrete, how did they increase their mass by five or six orders of magnitude even in the first billion years of the universe. And so to address these questions, uh, I run simulations with the cosmological radiation hydrodynamics code called ENZO, um, where we, in a self-consistent way, follow the formation of the first stars, their ionizing radiation, and the formation and evolution of the first uh, population of black holes. Um, and from the simulation data, we're able to produce uh, synthetic 21 centimeter maps um, uh, where we can study uh, sort of a synthetic global 21 centimeter signal that, uh, like the one DARE hopes to measure, uh, as well as 21 centimeter imaging of the sky, which may be observed with a lunar interferometer in the future. Um, and so with the synthetic data, we hope to understand how the properties of the first black holes and the first stars uh, actually influence the shape of this global signal and the uh, properties uh, such as power spectra of the 21 centimeter signal that may be observed in the future. Uh, so my poster is A6. My name's Jordan. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Poston. I'm a graduate student working for Tom Orlando at Georgia Tech in collaboration with Carl Hibbets at John Hopkins APL and uh, Darby Dyer at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. Um, our collaboration is working on primarily the interaction of water and hydroxyl with the lunar regolith. Um, and the big picture of why we're looking at that is because uh, we believe this will have um, profound implications for the transport of water on the moon as well as the thermal stability of water on the moon. Does, does it escape? How fast does it move around? Um, is it necessary that the solar wind form water or could this all just be from comets? That sort of, um, those sort of parameters are what we hope to explore by measuring the actual binding energies of water not just water ice, but um, water that actually molecularly chemisorbs to the surface of the moon. Um, furthermore, we're, we're thinking about the hydroxyl situation. Um, how does hydroxyl form? Does it come from the solar wind? What happens to it after it does form, assuming that it does? And um, do we get water from this hydroxyl or not? So uh, my colleague Jason McLean has a poster on that presenting the work that um, quite a few people in our group have been doing on the what happens to the hydroxyl. So again, my name is Michael Poston. I have a talk actually tomorrow afternoon at 4:30 um, in this very room, I believe, uh, on the thermal water or thermal stability of water and hydroxyl on lunar regular surrogates while we wait for our actual lunar samples. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Parvati Prem. I work with Professor David Goldstein at the University of Texas at Austin. Over in Austin, we've been simulating comet impacts on the moon with a view to investigating how much water from a comet could ultimately be deposited in the moon's permanently shadowed craters. We use a code designed to model rarefied planetary atmospheres to literally follow the water from the point of impact as it expands into a vapor cloud and then into a transient atmosphere, some of which does make it to the cold traps. There are several reasons we're interested in this. We want to find out 
whether a cometary source can account for hydrogen concentrations observed near the lunar poles. And secondly, given a lunar comet impact site, can we then predict where and in what form we might find water and perhaps other volatiles from that particular comet? To begin answering those questions, we're carrying out a parametric study of the influence of impact parameters, such as the impact angle, impact speed, comet density, and so on, on final retention and deposition patterns. I'll be over at poster number E23, which is titled uh, Cometary Delivery of Lunar Water, a Parametric Study. Um, I'm going to be there at both the poster sessions this evening and tomorrow. And I'd be more than glad to talk to you more about our research. Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Harrison Fast. I'm a graduate of the mechanical engineering department at the University of Colorado. I'm working on the Lunar Lab group under Dr. Jack Burns. Uh, we're working on a pretty cool project. We have a thermal vacuum chamber system, which we have dubbed the Lunar Simulation Laboratory. We use it to simulate lunar daytime and nighttime conditions to do material testing for a proposed lunar radio telescope, which um, Dr. Jack Burns actually mentioned earlier in his speech. Uh, my poster, A0, is entitled testing the deployment of lunar radio antenna material using a micro rover under simulated lunar conditions. My project has been to design and develop a very low cost and low complexity micro rover, which we took into our vacuum chamber system and unrolled some Kapton film. We then exposed the Kapton film to several cycles of lunar daytime and nighttime, as well as exposing the rover to those conditions and verified that our motors were able to survive through those simulated lunar conditions. Um, again, that's poster A0, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, good evening. I'm Jayashri Sridhar from India. I'm sure it's going to be difficult to pronounce my name. It's Jayashri Sridhar. I'm studying in Hindustan Institute of Technology. I'm doing my aerospace engineering, which mainly deals about the propulsion systems and structural designs of rockets and missiles. I also have a great passion and interest in lunar sciences, and I have published many papers in IAC, IEEE, and league meetings. Uh, in this forum, I've got two posters. Uh, one is in C14, which is titled as an experimental setup of lunar habitat uh, using lava tubes and emerging technologies. So this is about having a lunar habitat on the moon using uh, the resources which is available and also the emerging technologies. And the other poster is at uh, C25, which is titled as Sustainable Communication Systems Using Swarm Robotics for Lunar Exploration. So I, I was always been fascinated by robots. So this is about having an effective communication between the Earth and the moon. So um, I'd be really glad to have you all at my poster. And I take this opportunity in thanking NASA's Lunar Science Institute for their support and encouragement. So thank you so much, and do visit me. Hello, uh, my name is Christina Diaz. I have also just graduated from the University of Colorado. I am working with Dr. Jack Burns on the Lunar Array, and uh, I have a poster entitled Cosmology from the Moon, Determining Kapton's Reliability as a Radio Telescope Material. And what I'm doing is testing pieces of Kapton film to see how they survive the simulated lunar surface conditions. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kapton is a flexible polyamide film, and the lunar array will have photon-collecting dipoles sitting on top of the film and we'll basically just unroll on the lunar surface to deploy. So this summer, we conducted an experiment. We had a resistor embedded within the Kapton film, um, simulating the transmission lines between the dipoles. And those, um, uh, we uh, were in the vacuum chamber doing uh, lunar daytime and nighttime simulations. Um, we've performed our um, initial analysis um, to see if the Kapton was thermally and electrically insulating enough to keep the resistor from degrading or warping. 
uh, during those conditions. So uh, we've, we've done our analysis. I've got the results summarized in my poster. Um, it's out at E11, and uh, thank you.